say that. An insane person wouldn't think he's insane, right? Wrong. I'm not lying to you. You're living inside your brain. So you're a creature? Yes. This is cold, hard reality, and I really need you to accept that. Well, I can't have you living inside my brain. I would love to say you have a choice in the matter, but you really don't. What am I doing? You're stalling. You always stand here and do nothing. What are you trying to say? Open the door and talk to her, Rick. Speak. Hi. Hi. Um, look, I, I was wondering if you'd like to, um... Sure. Want to meet after work? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Cute. I'm pregnant. What? 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 Calm down, calm down. Don't tell me to calm down. You're pregnant. What? I I'm not pregnant. I know it's nearly time. Time for what? What? Time for what? Birth. Birth? Oh. Wait. Please, let me explain. I don't want to hear another word. I'm trying to talk to you. You're just throwing this. Better than not telling you. You can't be pregnant. Why? Because you're a bloke! I am not. I am neither male nor female. The voice! The voice is what you hear. It's what I choose to project to you, nothing more. Stay with me, Richard. Stay away. 
awake, Richard. Yes, Richard, I'm here. Who's been here? No one else has been here. And who cleaned all this up? You did. Could you used to talk about symbiosis. That we could benefit each other. That we could have a great life together. Well, that was a lie, wasn't it? Wasn't it? Calm down. Don't tell me to calm down! Be careful. You're treading on thin ice here, Richard. Down there, through the door. I'm joking. I mean, um, a few months. Nice. Nice. Key's total synergy. My life has improved. Shame what happened. A shame. You weren't calm. You know what, I... Don't talk back to me, Richard. Or what? I'll make you murder her in front of your colleagues. How about that? You continuously underestimate me. But I feel myself I can feel it. peeling away. This isn't transcendence. This isn't what was promised. This isn't what I am. Richard? Oh. You meant it when you called me a parasite, didn't you? The feelings I've been having, the fear of nothingness, it was all you. You tried to murder me. Oh, you are a terrible human being. What's happening to me? What, what are you doing? I can never trust you again. <laughs> you know, I truly thought we'd be friends. Live a long life together. Build a future together. You lied to me. And then, what did I expect? People lie all the time. This is the end, Richard.
let it work. Can we start over? Yeah. Lily. Richard. Richard. <laughs> It was me or you, and I had to pick me, me. I have to be able to make my own decisions, make up my own mind, not share it. I'm free now. Sometimes I look back on it all like a dream, a nightmare. But this is real. It's all real. Thank you very much. Uh, my name's Richard Alberston. I run Canon Films Limited, uh, and I'm here with the director of The Borer, Dominic Hodge. Hello. So uh, we're just going to talk a little bit about uh, the film that you just saw, The Borer, that Dominic directed and co-created with Ryan Jones. And then I'll open it up to audience questions. Okie dokie. So Dom, could you tell us a little bit about the inspiration and the genesis of the project? Sure. Um, well, it all started from like, uh, you know, everyone like watches, sits down, just watches films. And one night, um, me and my friend decided to have a little binge watch of uh, horror films, basically. And we started watching um, films by David Cronenberg and John Carpenter. And I immediately realised because I had to do a, a project, so this was for a university module. Uh, and I realised like I don't want to do something boring. I pardon the pun. I, I want to do uh, something you know horror based. Um, and then it kind of led me to wanting to do a body horror. Um, and kind of one thing led on from the other. Uh, finding out about the idea about the actual borer itself um, was actually just a random, uh, for some reason on YouTube, it tells you to go on random videos on the side that are completely unrelated to you. Uh, but one of the videos was about drilling. And it said boring. And I was like, well, that's weird. And I clicked it, and one thing led to another. And it turns out in some places in South America, there are little, um, parasites that latch onto plants called borers right. and they kill the plant um, but in turn completely feeding off themselves and then they spread and multiply for all these fields so I guess the thought was like what if what if it did it to humans instead. Wonderful. So you made the borer coming off the back of a feature film called yeah. Bastion. Yeah. How did the feature film process um, help you when it came back to making short form again? Well, I think because the feature film was so big and it was it was a lot to, a lot to have to contend with, lots more a lot more actors, lots of extras, huge amount of crew. It was just nice to go straight back down and actually made the process of doing the short film easier because I think after that I went into every scene thinking it was going to have the same kind of tribulations and issues that we did have during the the feature film process with not anticipating how busy it was uh, and how complicated it was going to be. So when I did this and it kind of went through quite with a breeze, and it was like, oh, this is fine. Uh, I think it just helped realign the kind of perspective on it. This made me more comfortable to make short films after doing something so big and challenging before. Wonderful. Now, I know there's some students in the audience here who might be going on to making their own short films. This one was quite long for a short film mm. and uh, had special effects and all sorts of different things. Can you explain, uh, just for their benefit, on how you managed to put so much into a short film, how much it cost, and what, how they could uh, do a short film similar on this scale without <laughs> having to resort to student tropes that we see time and time yeah. again. Yeah, I mean, that was a big thing for me, was trying to avoid student tropes. Like, I, I don't find it very appealing to watch films where uh, everyone in the room is continuously explaining the same social issue, for example, again and again. And I think it's quite good for students to try and do, you can still talk about these social issues. Like, this does have a, a kind of an allegory to mental illness. and the way people perceive themselves and aspiration and stuff like that but you don't need to show it by just showing them in a student hall um so we just thought let's just go for it let's try and get as big as possible but with the shoestring budget um i don't know that i had a very small job at the time part-time so i couldn't afford to go any anywhere above what we did but the budget itself was 200 pounds um, a lot of that went to paying for the actors travel expenses you can get good actors if you as long as you travel expenses and food, that's all they truly care about. Um, and if you're trying to go for an actor that wants salary, then they're, they might be too good for you at the moment with a budget of that, that kind of amount. Uh, locations we got for free, just by haggling and bartering and 
uh, some were work locations, some were friends, though, like homes and things like that. Special effects, you don't need to worry about spending lots of money to try and make something. Like, yeah, the, the, the Bora isn't the best looking thing in the world, but for me, it, it makes me laugh. It looks like a little sausage. Um, <laughs> But in reality, it was a, uh, um, well, you know, what it was. It was the, yeah. Uh, so it was just a kind of combination of just making things for cheap. Um, and I think the bore itself cost, I think it was four pound to make. Wow. And enough that we got enough materials with the four pound to make six borers. So it was good because then I could have six tapes of killing the thing uh, rather than just one. And then it looks a bit you know, a bit bad, and then I've lost that and I can't do another. Things like that, <laughs> things like the sick um, w was, was pennies. I think that was pound fifty to just buy jelly, <laughs> a bit of food colouring, um, and water with a little touch of gravy. A little touch <laughs> of gravy, that's what makes it a bit more disgusting. <laughs> uh, so things like that, just find the creative ways of using a small budget and just do what you want, make your own films, you know. <laughs> Can you just give us an idea of the afterlife that the film has had, uh, festivals, uh, and the attention it's received from outside bodies that weren't involved during the production? Sure, yeah. Well, obviously, uh, with you guys here, thank you for coming, by the way. Um, it's been shown here. Um, it's in the middle of uh, festival submission at the moment. Um, I'm waiting to hear back, but a lot of that stuff will be early next year. Uh, a big thing that we're working on, we've been working on together, is. Um, uh, producers kind of in uh, qu quite interested, I'd say, in uh, adapting this into a feature um, with a proper budget this time. So goodbye, two hundred pounds. Um, I can actually do what I want to do and make the borer look the way I want it to look um, with you know suitable actors of good state uh, stature and stuff like that. So that I mean that's that's what I'm kind of pushing this towards. Um, I did debate when I first finished this to go like, oh, should I just go ahead and make a sequel because I want to explore what happened to. Uh, the lady and Richard, um, but I think I'll, I'm looking forward to maybe this being a feature, which would be nice. Do you have any uh, advice or kind of life lessons for the filmmakers in the audience that are now really considering making a short film at university or outside of university and how they can maybe form that short film into a career kickstart? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, I, I think the big thing that I push for is uh, a lot of people seem to be really cut by the constraints. Do you know what I mean? Like, th I know this isn't a masterpiece, do you know what I mean? <laughs> but it's a, it was a passion project. I just wanted to make it. I wanted to make a body horror. Body horrors cost millions. Could I do it for 200 pounds? In some way, I succeeded and I did what I wanted to do. But a lot of people, I think, are constrained by the fact that they can't do something. Like, like oh, you know, we can't have uh, this kind of thing happen. We can't do a sci-fi because sci-fi is hard to do with, with not a lot of money. Some of the best sci-fis ever made were made on shoestring budgets. One of John, Car uh, John Carpenter's debut, uh, Dark Star, the alien is a beach ball. <laughs> and he ended up straight off the back of that making Assault and Precinct 13 and Halloween. And you know now he's John Carpenter. He's made millions for his life and made all the films he wanted to. So it, it doesn't really matter. As long as you're making the film you want to make um, and you're doing what you want to do, then don't let someone tell you you can't film that or it's not doable, just find a way around it. With the special effects, how did you work the Boris point of view from inside the body with the, the tube system? Um, again, that was, that was just a, it was a silly idea that I, I, th I, th I think it went actually quite all right in the end, but at the time we were sitting there thinking, how do we film someone's brain? And then uh, me and Ryan were in his kitchen having a cup of coffee and the washing machine was going on. And it was like, oh, wait a second, what about like a tumble dryer tube? Um, so we went to Screwfix, picked up a tumble dryer tube, filled it with, uh, with cabbage. <laughs> uh, it still sounds so ridiculous, doesn't it, when you say it like this? Yeah, we filled it with cabbage, chocolate syrup, uh, the jelly, that, that great jelly, and a bit of food colouring. And then we had to schmoosh it all inside. And then what we did is we laid it out on a, we had a long hallway in the flat we lived in. So we ran the tube along, uh, opened up my laptop, uh, for lighting and put the tube on top of the laptop and then got a strobe effect on the uh, laptop thing so it would, the light would come through it. And then we just used the GoPro, uh, took it off the mound, just rolled up my sleeves and then 
wriggle through the tube. And then we, we, we did a couple of straight takes, but it very much looked like a laundry tube with cabbage in it. <laughs> um, so in the end, Ryan just basically shifted it and did like, made it look a, like it was kind of writhing and pulsating. So yeah, it was a fun day. Very messy, though. A bit grim. I just had chocolate <laughs> syrup and cabbage stained me for a while. So from start to finish, how long did the Bora take to film, edit? Uh, we, we filmed over, I think it was a three-week shoot. I think, yeah, three weeks with additional reshoots and times after that, so probably about a month or so. And then we did some pickups about a month later. Editing-wise, uh, Ryan edited it in, I'd say probably a month to two months um, of straight editing. And then we'd we kind of do it simultaneously, so he'd be editing while I'd be scoring. Um, and then he'd give me pieces of, uh, of the scene and then I'd use it to make the score, basically. So yeah, probably about three, three, four months tops to make it all ready. Plans for a feature? Would yes. you turn it into yes. a full length film? Uh, yeah, so the producer, that, um, the producer that we're talking to at the moment, uh, who we've worked on, we've worked with casually before, uh, he wants to uh, make a horror. He's like a horror producer by trade, really. He's spent yeah. his whole career making horrors and being quite well known for doing so. Uh, and he wants to adapt uh, potentially the borer into a feature length film. So. I just need to go back to the drawing board, expand on certain bits. I know there's bits that I would do, like um, the weird little cult bit when they go upstairs and that Irish guy comes over. He was completely <laughs> underused. I wish I used him more. So I'd write more stuff for that kind of character in mind and try and build it up to at least 90 minutes. Nothing more than 90 minutes, but about that. So yes, definitely. So when you'd written the script, when it came to production, did you have to revise the material or uh, edit down the material due to limitations in the production process? Um, no, no, I don't think I did, no. I did a lot of rewriting, but that, uh, well, that's what you should be doing anyway uh, before you actually get to the film. And if you've only got one draft, then you've done it wrong, and there's something wrong with your script, you need to be keep doing it. But in terms of actually being on set, the only times was like occasional line changes or dialogue changes if it just didn't feel right on the day, or uh, if Daniel, the, the main actor, if he said it, and I was like, mm, that doesn't really sound right coming from him. Uh, sometimes I change it there, but no, mainly because I wrote it with limitations in mind. Uh, I wrote it that you know I couldn't you know cut to interior Heathrow Airport or cut to the moon. I know I couldn't do that yeah. kind of stuff, so I did deliberately try and pick locations that I could get, and I know there'd be a good chance of getting. So wonderful. Well, thank you very much, Dom. No so problem. We get another round of applause, please. Thank you.